Good evening to you all here in the auditorium at Middleton Hall, Hull University, and to those watching via our Facebook stream. I'm Catherine Townsley, Chair of the Hull City Official Supporters Club. It's my great pleasure, on behalf of the OFC and KCOM, to invite you to meet Hull City. We have a great panel lined up for you tonight, so I hope you've got your questions ready. Our compere for the evening is Hull City fan and BBC presenter James Hogarth. Well, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, nice to see so many of you uh, here tonight. And uh, hello to the audience via the live stream on Facebook this evening. As Catherine said, this evening is about you. And let's be honest with you, this is the first opportunity that you've had to hear at length from the new owners, the new manager of Hull City. And this is the first opportunity, more importantly, that you've had to put your questions, your passion to those people this evening. So let's welcome our guests of honour this evening. We'll start with the man who I suppose probably has one eye on the finances day in, day out and hopes that the stadium is nice and full, starting of course with tomorrow's game against Huddersfield. Would you welcome the Chief Executive of Hull City Football Club, Jim Rodwell. Next uh, to the man, I suppose, is the owner's eyes and ears on a, a daily basis, and I guess the man who will be signing the players in the summer. Uh, would you welcome Hull City's brand new vice chairman, Tan Kessler? Next uh, to a member of the playing squad, he's not been in action, sadly, for the last few weeks uh, because of injury, uh, but as a whole-born player in a squad made up of lots of locally-born players, I guess he's the elder statesman of the whole-born players these days. Would you welcome, to answer your questions this evening, Louis Coyle. And there won't be many, I guess, managers of Hull City who get a personal best wishes from his country's Prime Minister. Uh, he also, at the weekend, whilst playing a game for Rangers, proved the old adage of, he's still got it. The manager of Hull City Football Club, Shot Avaladze. Just a quick bit of technicals for our guests this evening. Um, I know we're in the middle of a pandemic, but we've sanitised the microphones tonight. So that microphone is for you two. So when you're asked a question, if you can just share that microphone. And likewise, the blue one is for you too as well. Blue for Rangers as well. Nice happy accident. So it's down to you. Uh, you can, I know there will be a lot of fans watching via the live stream on the KCOM Facebook page tonight. So you're more than welcome to send your questions in via that. There is the whole City Official Supporters Club Twitter feed as well. Get yourself on there. And if you aren't here tonight but watching remotely, then we'll put the questions or I'll put those questions on your behalf. So now, without further ado, we'll begin the questions. Now, the lights are quite bright, so I may have to sit down throughout the course of the evening. But if you could raise your hand at some stage, we'll come and bring a microphone across to you. But we'll, we'll just start with, I think, Shotter, if that's all right. Nice to see you this evening. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome to the University of Hull. Um, you spent the last week of the international break doing selfies outside of Beverly Minster. Uh, or you said, so you're clearly getting into Hull, aren't you? You're clearly enjoying this area and it's clearly made you feel very welcome. First of all, uh, thank you for invitation. Thank you for time. And uh, that, that's generally uh, easy because it's very, very nice people, very warm. And it doesn't look to me that I, I have a feeling like I've been 
here before. I don't know what I was doing. <laughs> but uh, when I walk outside, when I sit and having a coffee, even if it's a good game or a bad game, sometimes I had a good game and it was easy to go. And I thought, okay, people are nice. But then we had a bad game. But the people even been warm and saying like, hey, come on, it's not going to be always like this. It's, well, things will change. And that makes, of course, uh, everything uh, uh, brilliant and they're good. So weather doesn't help to be warm, but people help to, to be warm. So um, that's, 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 that's a good sign. And can I ask, I know it's the cliche question, but have you had a patty butter yet? Patty butter? Patty butter. <laughs> Patty booty? It's our chip shop delicacy. No. <laughs> Can we get one, please, across to the stage? Um, and, and Louis, I, I would like to, to welcome you as well before the questions begin. Um, you've been out the team the last few weeks because of injury. Where are you at with that injury right now? How are you feeling? Yeah, no, it's been um, a frustrating time this season. Obviously, spent a lot of a lot of time injured, um, but worked hard to get back from from the most recent one. Um, I'm back out on the grass. I'm back training with the group. Um, I've had two or three training sessions under my belt, so I feel like I need to sort of get get back to where I was and and, and get my fitness back and, and get back involved. Back before the end of the season, do you hope? Yeah, most definitely. Um, be back in contention hopefully next week, and and we'll take it from there. Well, guys, it's down to you, whether you're watching on the live stream on Facebook this evening or indeed in the auditorium here, this beautiful Middleton Hall that was renovated a few years ago and is, is a fabulous place to be this evening. So the questions are down to you. So could I see from the audience where the show of hands will be? And believe me, it's actually quite hard to see. So if the person with the roving mic could go to a hand for me, please, and uh, we'll take the first question from the audience tonight. I can see uh, somebody within the middle row of the, uh, the audience. Say so your, your question tonight and, um, and, and hello and welcome to this event this evening. Yeah, it's a question for Jim. I know initial discussions have taken place um, between yourselves and Hull City ladies. The women's game's the biggest growing uh, sport in the UK. Can the club go on record and state that they're going to support women's uh, football going forward? And if so, what's that going to look like? I'm not sure I'm going to go on the record about anything, but, um, well, first of all, thank you for inviting us here tonight. It's great to be here. We have. We've, we've, we've met with um, the whole ladies team at the moment. We've had positive conversations with them. And I share all your sentiments about it's one of the fastest growing sports, certainly in terms of participation in the country. I think we've got to be very clear. If we say we're going to support something, it's no good just throwing a little bit of money at it and you know, hoping that things work out for the best. I think with everything that we're going to try to do, we'll try to do in a sustainable fashion and hopefully something that can be around for, for several years. I'm led to believe that the ladies' team has had various incarnations and it's, it's, it's ebbed and flowed. What we would like to do is to put maybe do something or try to understand what sustainability looks like. That's, that's what I think we can probably support. But our initial meeting, our initial conversations were positive and I think we as a football club understand how important ladies football is you know, to the country, not just to, uh, to the people in Hull. Jim, uh, that question of sustainability, you're, you're the money man, if you like. You're the man on the, gr on the ground, the day-to-day -day running of the football club. Um, you inherited what looked like a very stable business, and, and, and uh, people can talk about the previous owners and have their views on them. But what shape was the business in when you inherited it a few months ago? Well, I think it's like any football club, it's like any business. You inherit it with the challenges. I think we went into this, you know, this incredibly with our eyes wide open. Tan worked on this for six months, eight months prior to completion. So, but uh, football clubs are always the same. They uh, never fail to surprise you, both in good ways and bad ways. But it's an excellent football club. You know, we've got our challenges. We know we have. We, you know, we haven't got uh, our chairman, you know, tasks us. To, to, to try to drive income and spend money as sensibly as possible. But again, he wants us to be successful. And that ends up costing you a few bob somewhere. And I think our chairman's gone on the record of saying that this is an exercise in him becoming any richer. 
but we've also got to spend money sensibly. It's not the land of milk and honey. We've got to be very clever, very shrewd. We've got to make sure our football operation is the best in the championship. All these types of things. Doesn't mean we're going to spend as much money as some of the teams in the championship, but we can aspire to have the best operation. So the club was okay. The club was okay. Our challenge as the now custodians is to take it on to the next level and, and hopefully make it uh, a little bit better. If you want to show your hands, we'll, uh, if you can raise your hand now, then the microphone will come to you. As we're doing that, uh, a question from a couple of people who sadly can't be here, and this one is for you, Louis Coyle, if you can grab the mic. Um, this is from Tiffany and daughter Ava. Uh, now, they wanted to be here tonight, but sadly, um, they've been testing positive for COVID, sadly. Now, Ava apparently is a big fan of Louis Coyle. So... There you are. You've got a fan out there. Um, any chance of a special get well message for Ava, who's currently watching the stream on Facebook tonight, but sadly can't be here? Yeah, of course. No, first of all, thank you, Ava, obviously, for, um, for being a supporter of mine. Um, it's nice to hear. Obviously, terribly sorry you can't be here tonight. It would be nice to have you in the, in the crowd. Um, hoping you recover well. Hopefully, it's not a bad case of the, the COVID and you're recovering soon, and, and we'll see you in the stadium very shortly. A get well message works just like the vaccine, clearly, Perfect. from Louis Coyle. Let's have a question from our audience this evening. Uh, what's your name and what's your question, please? My name's David. Um, thank you, gentlemen, for actually sparing the time to meet us this, uh, this evening. It's always good, actually, to get your, your views. My question is for Shotter. How impressed are you with the standard of football in the Championship? I think um, that was the game I expect. I was watching. I generally see the uh, last five, six years, we always follow, we always see the games. And uh, if you see the difference between the last five, six, seven years, it, it much changed because ball go more down, more football, more nice and organized games. So things get very, very tough, and 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 the and team. It is it's a great competition, by the way, to to see how much teams can compete with each other. So um, expectation was high, and uh, I generally every game see that. You've managed in Turkey, and forgive me, was it Uzbekistan as well? Yes, in 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 Maccabi Tel Aviv in Israel. How does it compare in terms of? You've managed teams that will clearly have had potentially more European success or got to European competitions more than Hull City have so far. But how does it compare in terms of quality with the other countries that you've coached in? I think uh, Turkish league is is different, but physical as as we have here, but less uh, less tactics. Here it's uh, much more. Or how I say that tactical game is still goes on and that. The teams they're reading each other, preparing each other. In Turkey, it's more individual game. Um, in Uzbekistan, it was Asia, and it's a lot of a lot of uh, people that never look on that side. And uh, I would say, like uh, countries like uh, Saudi and Qatar and um, uh, Iran, which they hardly miss uh, World Cups, uh, and they have a huge. Like uh, the clubs, like having a hundred millions uh, and spending hundred millions, probably you know how he was quite long working there in Al Sadd. They win the Champions League. It's Korean teams, which is the huge companies they they finance. Japanese clubs are quite tough and 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 um, having a good competition with this. So it's it, it's a good level. It's a it's a tough level, which probably we don't look. And we don't know much, but it was for me it was a huge, huge uh, space to see and learn uh, how in Asia happens, and it was quite interesting to to be honest. But okay, again, like uh, when you want to be around, when you want to be uh, on the screen, I think England is the best place to be. So uh, thanks to God, uh, thanks to people uh, who gives me this chance to be here. So uh, I'm in the right place. 
Welcome, by the way, if you are just watching this via the stream this evening on Facebook. This is the Middleton Hall, and this is the first time that Hull City fans have at length had the opportunity to question our guests this evening, including uh, some who can't be here tonight but are uh, sending in questions via social media this evening. Um, if you want to raise your hand, by the way, we'll be back in the audience in a moment's time with a question. But this one is via Twitter. and I'm not sure if this one could be for Jim or for Tan. Um, but the, the question is... Will the current membership scheme that's in place right now be retained for next season? Or are you looking at any changes to how fans buy season tickets? Well, I'm going to say thanks for the question and pass it on to Jim. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a really good question, obviously. Um, We've, we had a brief conversation about this today, but it's, it's part of a much bigger topic. We've looked at, we've all looked at all the, all the available options. There are three options really, aren't there? There are keep it the same, lower tickets or put tickets up. I mean, it's as simple as that in many regards. It's, it's how we do that. You know, we understand that our fans are facing, we're all facing the same challenges with inflation running out of control. But I mean, to put, put, to put things in context, we're looking at our utilities bill. I mean, nobody's really interested in this, but apart from Tan and I. But, uh, you know, we're, we're doing budgets at the moment, and our utilities bill is looking like it's going to be another million quid next year. And, you know, we take a big gulp when we see figures such as that. You know, we think, uh, we understand the backstory of, of, of what happened previously with the tickets. And I think the club's got itself into a good place at the moment. Um, with where the memberships sit and the price points and the way that people can buy tickets with some of you guys that I've met previously in the fan groups that we've sat down with. Um, I don't think there's, a, the, the, there's any particular issue with tickets at the moment. I think most people in this room probably feel that tickets represent decent value. But, um, yeah, we're looking at everything, to be honest with you. We were looking at lowering tickets. We were looking at the impact of slightly increasing tickets. We're looking at what's it mean if they're the same. So... I don't think we're going to do anything overly drastic, to be perfectly honest with you. We want, we've got to find that balance about getting as many of our supporters into the stadium as is humanly possible. Our chairman's made that absolutely clear. He wants more people in the stadium. And we understand that some of that is down to what it costs to watch a football match. Everybody's purse is, is struggling at the moment. It's probably not going to get any easier. So we've got to make sure that we get the right product on the pitch. But we've also got to try to make it affordable. And it's a, it's a challenge at times, I think it's fair to say. It's, it, it's a challenge, but hopefully we'll come up with something that's fair and equitable. Let's go back to the audience this evening. Uh, do we have a question? It's very quiet. So raise your hand if you have got a question. Now, I've got some that have been sent to me. Now, oh, there's a gentleman um, on the front row. If the mic could go down to this gentleman. Before we go to, to him, um, we've got a, a question from social media for you, Shotter. Um, this is from Gavin, Gavin Lamb, who says, where do you realistically want to finish in the league table this season? I know on the big press conference to, to launch the new ownership, the, the uh, action jokingly said six let's rule out six now uh where would you, what what it, what's your personal target for the end of the season we have seven twenty one points to collect and uh, generally I, I'm, I'm i'm answering this question every single um game coming game saying like we have to get uh, and we look for get max we can for each games and um i would I would lie if I say so. We 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 said like we have to take out of twenty one, uh, fifteen, twelve, or or any any like that. But it's easy way when we say and when we look uh, to to target it the, the the coming game and see how much we can do for this game. And max is three points, of course. And if if we look and if you look at our games, even the games we lose you will definitely see that the team came out to win and not holding like a game, killing game or whatever. So, of course, the opponents are, 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 are uh, making for us sometimes uh, much more difficult. But uh, generally, we go out to win. And that is exactly the target we want to build and we want to go and we want to start every preparation after next, after the previous game, to start looking forward and 
get much as we can from the previous one, making some mistakes and, and go up again and then look forward for the three points. And that's where it's going to go. And uh, I, I believe... I believe they will get like as uh, much as we can points, and uh, and in one stage we will say it was something like uh, we we targeted it or we are step back or we're step ahead. The gentleman, on very the very diplomatic. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so basically, but the best possible it's, outcome. It's true story. So that's the way we look. So uh, that we've made it to the bottom row. The gentleman has a question. Your name and your question, please. Um, the question is, as in charge of the SMC, do you have control of the sort of configuration on the ground? I know you only just come, so you haven't had control of it in the past. And to frame that question, what I'm talking about is, I think the atmosphere at the KCOM has been pretty poor ever since we went there. And um, when we first started, I picked a seat in the south stand and when the stadium opened, I know there was a lot of complaints, but the children's section was put in the far corner at the far end of the east stand, between what would be the east stand and the away fans, which I can't understand who on earth would have ever thought of that as a, as a good idea. And um, after the, in the first summer, I was sent a letter saying that where I was now sat was going to be the, the children's stand, which was in S2. And um, because I'd picked my seat, I wasn't, you know, I was, I was allowed to stay there forever sort of thing. And so were the people that were around me. Um, but that to me never really, you know, it, it never really succeeded because not enough people moved out of the area that I was sat in. So the following summer, which was the second year in there, everybody in those seats that I was sat in were offered uh, a deal, a special deal, to go up top in the upper tier of the... And at that stage, because some of them had got fed up of the small influx of kids, shall we say, because there wasn't that many seats for kids to take up anyway. So quite a lot of people then decided to move up top. And... Uh, they, they, they created their own community. I used to keep in touch with some of them. They liked it up there, and they made new friends and all the rest of it. Then, of course, when we got involved in the membership scheme and everything got, everybody just got kicked out of wherever they were, we were told that the, the players had voted that they wanted their own fans behind both goals, which seemed pretty logical because traditional football sort of fans used to be behind the goals. And uh, that broke up a lot of the community that was in the East Stand, and it went into the North Stand. And unfortunately, due to a lot of rubbish, I got kicked out of my seat and ended up in the North Stand, which, when that opened, was pretty dead. But by the time that had f got closed down again, that community was making quite a din in the, in the North Stand, and it was quite good. But... It didn't never seem logical to me that, you know, we, we, we've got a, a, a lower ball and, you know, we started off with one end empty. It, it just doesn't, doesn't make any sense. And surely it would have been better to go right round and right behind the other goal because um, I was in, like, N5, I think it was, um, which was to the right of the goal. So even when we was in the Premiership, there was... The next two blocks were, were for away fans. So the home fans could go all the way around, which is something like what you did at that ticket offer. They had that section, at the, 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 you know, following on from the east stand. Are, are you following what I'm talking about? Or am I, <laughs> or am I rabbiting? Jim, were you making notes? Men mentally, I am. But I think, I think what... Maybe, maybe I, I don't know, maybe just trying to sum up. I understand that football fans are very territorial about where they sit. And, you know, you might sit next to your friends for 20, 30 years watching a football match and that's where you see your pals. And I understand that. And I think I understand that it's incredibly frustrating when you're asked to move on a regular basis. I don't really understand the specifics of your issue and you're far more familiar with the ground than I. I think the only, the only kind of... I, I, 
why these changes have happened, I've absolutely no idea. The only thing that I can probably offer up is obviously the Upper West was, was shut when we first got there. Um, I think it's been open now, certainly for the Luton game, we look to open it. And that's been due to increased attendances. You know, it was shut because people, you know, for what for whatever reason, weren't turning up to the football matches. You know, it would, doesn't make any sense whatsoever to open that for, you know, 50 people or even 100 people. So what we've got to do as a football club is work harder to entice you guys to come to the games. You know, it's the demand that ultimately will get us to open that West Upper because everybody that I speak to on a regular basis seems to like going in the West Upper. People like sitting there. We want you to sit there, but there has to be an economic reason to do that, I think. You don't want to be a bit of a pig in a poke and have you know 50 people up there. It makes no sense. I think I think the cost to clean it, somebody told me the other day, I think the cost just to clean the West Upper is about 3,000 quid a game. Never mind stewarding and everything else. It's just really a question of economics. But I take your point. We need to come up with something so people understand that where their seat is their seat. And I completely get that that, uh, you know, you want to sit ne next to your pals and get familiar with an area. Probably that's the best I can do. Can I f ask you a follow-on question? Um, oh. I've got a follow-up question. Yeah, sure. We'll, we'll get the microphone to you with a follow-up question while we do that. Um, this question is from uh, Mike, who says, will the North Stand be given back to home support and then therefore repositioning the away? Are you considering... Picking up on that question about reconfiguring, if you like, where people... Yeah, listen, I think, I suppose that's why we do these fans' forums. So we can, you know, Tan and I haven't got all the answers. We've been here two months. You know, we listen to you guys. We try to understand what you want, some of the things we can do, some of the things we can't do. Um, the North Stand, why are the away fans in the North Stand? I think it's because, and I said, you guys understand better than me, it's where the away team coaches go. It's easy to get people in. You know, we have a lot of stakeholders like the police, our safety advisory group, the sports ground safety authority. We have a lot of people that we have to appease with all our our, 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 our crowd strategies. We have a lot of people that we have to keep happy, probably more than we had to previously. Um, so are we going to take away fans out of the North Stand? I haven't seen a proposal to do so, but you know, we'll go back from this and we will take your feedback and we'll speak to our stadium guys, we'll speak to Paul, we'll speak to Chris, and I'll ask the question, why are the away fans in the North Stand? Well, let's have that follow-on question. Uh, from that gentleman. Now, what is your question, please? Yeah, well, I go, I go right back to 1966. I saw Andy Davidson play, so that's how... Good year for football. Back. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, twice we got... We, we, that was our last championship. But I wanted to, to bring up the points you made about the Upper West Stand. I don't know what information you've been given, but do you know when they closed the Upper West Stand? No, I don't, sir. 20, 2016. You know what happened in that season? We got promoted to the Premier League, and yet we closed the Upper West Stand, which, of which I was it sat there for years. You don't know how many hundreds of people have said to me and other people, they'll come back when they get their seat back on the Upper West Stand. It was, I mean, this goes back, to, when, we, when we went up in, in 2008 to the Premier, to the, through the playoffs, the whole of Wembley Stadium was packed. I was so proud to be from Hull. I was there. Uh, yeah. You were. And you saw there. it, right. We were there in 2016 when we, when we were in the playoffs again, because there were loads of empty seats. And that's because the previous administration had, by my language, pissed us all off. Was that the so, one where Modi Arby scored the win? Correct. But there I was there, yeah. Sheffield you played Sheffield Wednesday. Wednesday. Yeah. yeah, Sheffield Wednesday were packed. Yeah, We I had remember. loads of empty places. That was really sad. And that's yeah, because I remember of the that. way that the previous owners, name changes and closing the West, and the membership scheme, I was a senior, I'm a senior. We went from, from having senior price to paying full price. There were no concessions. Anywhere in the football, nowhere else in the country did a football club have no concessions, except for in Hull. So, so... You know, I think you need to think very carefully about reopening up West Stand. It isn't just about 50 people. You'll get hundreds back in there. You'll get the atmosphere back. Because it's terrible to see that empty stand all the time. We, we, we absolutely want you to be right. We absolutely, you know, Tan and I sit there for hours talking about these things with, with Joe and with Paul and with, with, with our team. Um, we want to open it. We want to see it full. We all, we all violently agree about this. And, but, you know, there's got to be a demand. We've got to get people. I think people have got out of the habit of coming to the stadium. You know, people, the pandemic didn't help for many, many reasons. But, you know, people get into the habit of going somewhere. They get out of the habit of going somewhere. We understand that we've got to work hard to give you, we've got to create the right environment to get you guys and get your friends and get your kids into the stadium. 
Our, our chairman's been quite clear. He's tasked us. He's told us, we want more, I want more people in that stadium. You know, Tan and I have to, at times, gently persuade him that, you know, opening the gates for free is not maybe the, the most economically sensible idea. That's what our chairman would do. He would open the gates. But um, we've got to do it in a sensible way. But I, I can put my hand on my heart and say, we want that West Upper open. But there's got to be a bit of a business case for it. You know, what I'm suggesting we've got to make a fortune from it, even if it washes its face with a few, a few hundred people. We want to open... Well, thank you very much for that question. Back to the audience in a moment's time. I want to bring in Tan, and, and perhaps one for, for Prashota as well. Um, this one is from Chris Dunn, who's watching online this evening, who asks, will Hull City be bringing in uh, more quality foreign players um, in the summer? Are you looking at a, a number of foreign signings, or are you maybe putting your eggs into one basket and, and after a big marquee player? I mean, I was expecting this question to be, to be fairly uh, uh, coming in. Um, uh, for us to say we are not looking, that would make us more ignorant, I, sh I assume. So we have, we have international scouts, we're, we're, we have a huge network. Yes, we do follow international talent, but we have to understand something. And moving forward in, in England, the homegrown players are more valuable. And, and be, are going to be more valuable also. And to, to develop our own talent for us at the moment, with all respect to the coach, I'm sure he will also vouch for this, is that um, it's more important for us. So for, yes, we do look for international players, talents to come in, showcase themselves like Alahyar, or maybe even better, maybe, you know, more helpful to us or, or, or more well-known globally, you know, um, uh, recognized players. But if I just say we're just looking at um, international players, then it would be uh, me against the industry uh, because it's currently uh, the, the biggest value everybody's searching for is, is homegrown English players that can play in premiership, that can play in championship. And on one of those, of course, um, made his England debut, and I can't think there have been many whole-born England players since probably Nick Barnby. Certainly, there have been players who've played England under-21 football since Nick Barnby, but certainly one to actually have Hull as a birth city is, is, is certainly unusual, um, and hopefully that will change. But um, how proud, Chosa, were you for Keen Lewis Potter on um, what Tuesday night when he came on? Admittedly, for five minutes, but... He's now a fully-fledged England player. Yeah, uh, I think uh, all of all of all of them who been involved with this with this uh, like a career, let me say this way, like uh, this is his academy time, his coaches, and and and, and the the team who who, who bring and uh, anyone who helped him to come on this level, being proud, and uh, I had this. Like um, hours, uh, actually uh, worked with him. If you look uh, all back uh, in his background, but I can imagine how proud I was, and I can imagine the people who really spend energy and and, and put a lot of effort to 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 make him like he is, and it's just a good good and fantastic beginning uh, for him. And I believe it gives uh, like a huge example and, and, and to others and a motivation to 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 do to do the, uh, something they really love to do. You know, it's a game. It's a fantastic game, and I can imagine everything was close last two years. Everything and still game was keeping people happy a little bit. These football players keep, was keeping. Uh, something to go on and he's one of them he's one of them who will keep um, us you guys uh, me and uh, people around him uh, happy again that's that's something he he shows and we've been as a club and as a people who knew him a little bit short or long really proud even it's a five minutes it's, uh, it's it's a huge huge step for him for 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 this uh, this world and uh, I hope he realised and uh, and uh, just thank the people who helped him to be there. We had a, a question I think from 
uh, someone in the, the, the audience. What's your name and what's your question, please? Hi, it's, uh, my name's Matt Simpson. I'm a local PE teacher at South London School and, and the East Riding Schools FA as well, so I run all the county teams. And one big positive from the club the last 10 years has actually been the, the rollout of young you know, players locally. I was going to ask Louis, first of all, and the manager, you've mentioned KLP and how, how highly you rate him and also Jacob Greaves. And financially, would it make sense in the summer if the big Premier League clubs in coming for 15, 20 million, do we do a Jared Bowen and, and reinvest back into a, a new competitive team in the championship? <laughs> sorry. <laughs> a few questions. Uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, I try to, could you repeat your question and then just try to give as political answer as possible? To, to... Uh, yeah. Do we cash in on the best, two best players at the club? Um, I mean... To be honest with you, um, if I say yes, it, it, it would just create huge animosity. If I say no, it wouldn't please your answer, you know, like your question. However, we have to do best for the club, not best for us, ownership. The most important thing also, uh, these boys, not only them, uh, we have Brendan as well coming in and, and a couple other homegrown players that we are very hopeful. Um, Let's just serve the, the destiny of the club first and then move to a, a, a better or, if not, a different journey. So w we are ambitious. Um, I'm not, I'm not uh, afraid to say that our, vice, our, our chairman set the rules. So we'd like to, I mean, coaches here, we all put our hands into this along with you, and I want you to believe in this. At one point, we want to go to premiership whether we can achieve it or not. But Premier people, League. you know, like we, we all have to have Premier a Premier League. So like we all have to have um, um, some sort of a goals and, 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 and uh, um, uh, kind of like a, a dr driven ideas. So is, is it easy? No. Can this be achievable? Yes, with the, with the current talent group, why not? They're developing. We already produced an under-21 national team player. Jacob is on the, on the standby. So um, many more to come. And we can, you know, with the current, Louis can also, like, I guess, elaborate that he's been here for a while. So he's seen it. Harvey, we have. Uh, why not? Uh, but to cash in, I don't know if it's the right word uh, to cash in. Do we need to cash in? No. We need to show you guys a better football so that to answer your question that then when we open the stands so you can come in and then and, 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 and you can see better football so that you, you're willing to pay as much as you can and we, we are then happy to happy and appreciative about your contribution. So it's all about what we have on the pitch, um, not just finding the, the right money and just cash it in. It's just keeping the talent and, and group of guys taking to a next level. If we can't reach to that next level, yes, as a management, why not? We should consider the, the offers because, you know, we have Louis, I, I don't know, you can jump in. Everybody has dreams as well. These players, these boys, they all want to play different level of football, whether it's an international level, whether it's, it's Premier League, whether championship. Right? I, I don't know if... Yeah, no, I think um, touching on that, it's obviously fantastic to have the likes of Kino, Greaves, obviously Brandon as well. Um, the lads being from, being from Holland and obviously being as, as brilliant as they have been this season and in, in seasons gone by. Um, I think I'll speak for every player that's played the game, currently playing the game. Everybody has ambitions and, and, and expectations of themselves to get to the highest level that they think they can reach. And I think Greaves and Kino, Brandon included, can, can go to the top and... Listen, I think everybody in this room wants that to be with us um, and, and for us all to get there together. But ultimately in football, and, and if we're all being realistic, if, if teams come in for, for these types of players and, and everything aligns and, and everything's right, then at times in football, you lose these players to, to, Premier, to Premier League clubs. Um, of course, none of us want that to happen, but selfishly for the player, sometimes that, that is the right thing to do. Um, and that's just me being real and, and honest. Um, let's just enjoy the boys as as long as they're with Hull. Hopefully, it's it's forever, and we go to the Premier League, and 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 everybody's dream comes true. But um, ultimately, the, these things happen in football. Um, keep your microphone because I've got a question directly to you. 
uh, this evening, um, Louis. And don't forget, you can, if you're not here in the audience tonight, uh, send the questions in via the, uh, the live stream on Facebook and also through uh, Twitter as well. Um, this question is from Will to you, Louis. Um, from a player's point of view, from your point of view, um, what's the difference with working with show to say compared with Grant McCann, who signed you, of course. How are the two coaches that you've played for now pl uh, coached you, and how do they differ in, in terms of philosophy or, or mentality? How have things changed between Grant McCann and Show Savalade? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, every manager brings something different. Um, the gaffers come in and and, and showed us a whole a whole sort of new level of knowledge and, and obviously from his, his playing days and, and his coaching days um, where all he is it's new ideas new new things he wants to to implicate and, and bring bring to us guys and things take time the gaffer's obviously getting used to us we're getting used to the gaffer and um, these things these things do take time but I think obviously myself not not been on the pitch recently but watching the boys and, and watching how they're implicating the things that the gaffer wants them to do um, and the boys seem to be picking it up very, very quickly. Um, so the longer time we spend together um, as a group with the gaffer, working with him, getting to know what he likes, what he wants us to do, vice versa, um, I think it'll bode well for, for being successful moving forward. Uh, we'll go to an audience member in a moment's time. We have one. Uh, one final question. Um, this is from Steve Day um, to you, Louis. Is of course, your, your brother and dad run a, a veg stall, fruit and veg stall in Hull City Centre near the Three Ships mural. Is Tommy's strawberry sourced in the UK? Yes, they are. Uh, good question, but yeah, they're um, they're locally grown in Kingham for anybody asking. So that's where they're uh, that's where they're from. So, <laughs> any other fruit and veg related questions? We're here till uh, nine o'clock this uh, this evening. Um, let's go back. You uh, yeah yeah UK supporters of UK fruit and veg. So five a day in Hull from this area. <laughs> um, let's get back to the audience and a question. Your name and your question, please. Yep. Uh, my name's Steve Day. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, this is uh, aimed at Jim. Uh, just uh, based on your, uh, you mentioned about the, uh, the cleaning bill and also you're making, you know, the environment inviting uh, for supporters, et cetera, and a safe environment, uh, you know, with COVID, et cetera. Um, I, we, we probably had a stain under our seats probably, you know, a decade now. And I, I can categorically say uh, in the East End, we've never had our seats cleaned, you know, and obviously are you getting value for money from your uh, cleaning bill? Yeah, I was... <laughs> It's a very good question. I mean, I was talking specifically about the cleaning bill in the West and uh, in the Upper West. But yeah, you're right. I mean, I suppose it brings us on to a bigger subject, doesn't it, about, about the stadium. You know, it's a great stadium. It's lovely. It was built for you guys specifically as the people of Hull. But it's, you know, it's shown signs of wear and tear and it's creaking a little bit, isn't it? And like I said, it could do with a decent clean and I'm sure that you guys understand the issues much better than I do. And we're actually embarking at the moment, we're in conversations with the council at the moment, talking about some of the, some positive conversations with the council about some of the dilapidations in the stadium and what we do about it, some of the bigger issues, the roof and various issue, construction issues. Um, but it's something that we have to deal with. Again, it's just one of the challenges that we've that we've inherited. And I think there are things that we can do, probably some more quite simple things with the seats. And I think we've got a programme of works for the close season where we try to give the place, a real, make the place a lot more spick and span than it probably is at the moment. But it's, yeah, it's, it's something that we need to do better. We accept that, but we are looking at, the bigger picture as well about how we make the stadium fit for purpose for the next five years, ten years, or sort out some of the remedies. And obviously the freehold of the stadium is owned by the council, so they're heavily involved in that conversation, but they've been uh, very supportive to date. So now the challenge is, can you get rid of that stain before the Huddersfield game tomorrow night? <laughs> can, can I what, sorry? Get rid of that stain under Steve's seat by tomorrow night's game. If he tells me where it sits, I go and do it myself. I have no problem. <laughs> um, I don't I mind actually, getting dirty. I actually pick up the microphone just for that. I was just going to find out your seat so that, as you can see, we're sitting far away. He'll have his marigolds so get, on in the morning. get more farther and farther. 
Can I ask you a sort of supplementary um, question to that? In terms of the the stadium itself, I I think people would accept that it's perhaps showing its 20-year-old age now, but you've talked about a wider development in in West Park. Um, What... What's your vision for around the stadium particularly? And is that patch of land that sort of is bordered by two railway lines is, is, is obviously quite locked, but it is pretty disgraceful, really, the state it's in. Um, can you do anything with the land? Have you got ideas of, of, of doing more with the surrounding area around the MKM Stadium? Um, the surrounding area, for sure. And... and I'll be very honest and, and open to openly tell you our vision. Um, I don't know um, if we can do specifics around the railway for fans to understand that because it's just too complicated. But our vision is eventually um, bringing everything back on the stadium and developing all the pitches around it. Because what I understood f- uh, f- eight months ago when, we f- when I first arrived and then start speaking with the council members and, and, and fans and previous ownership and, and as, as Jim is witness on that one, we realized the stadium is built to, to I want to choose my word very wisely, revitalize the, the, the area. So has it been serving that purpose? Fairly yes, fully no. So why not? Uh, we can develop the, 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 the surrounding areas that kind of belong to the, to the stadium, uh, stadium lease rights. Uh, we're trying to bring the academy back maybe in the, in the long run and, 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 and to surprise, you know, Louis on this one and the coach, maybe the, the senior team back on, back on the stadium where with the right development plan. Do we have the vision? Yes. Do we have the plans? Yes. Are we in touch with the council and council members and, 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 and all the stakeholders, yes. And now it's just an ongoing progress that we want to actually, uh, with, with our vice, you know, our chairman's vision, we want to like just complete it and, 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 and put our signature on the, on the community, you know, develop on the community. So to answer your question, yes, we have the vision. Uh, We'll go to somebody with a question in a moment's time. Um, One on Facebook, and Tan, uh, slightly for you and also for Shota as well, um, and you have, in a way, sort of touched on this, but um, what is the the vision for the team for next season uh, in terms of its look and its shape? Have you started that that planning process now, or is it sort of linked in wherever the club finishes this season? Actually, that's a good question also. Yes, we done from the first day, and um, that's probably what Coyle uh, mentioned. That, that the coach comes, he wants to see. For generally, it, it could could look like a little bit simple things more, but more like a shape, more to do things in the shape, and uh, that's that's because we do and because we have that that idea how to continue, how to make a next step how to target it, things like we can. And um, that's that's a step has been done already for for last two months. And if we do something like a little bit good in, in like a, the team does, that's definitely because of that. And, uh, and uh, it shows and we have some good things which we improved and we have things that we have to definitely improve well. So that's been done. It's been showed that been worked in the field also and in the video sessions. So uh, we definitely look and work hard on it. And I believe uh, players see that and uh, feedback is also good. And we're going to continue this, of course. We've got uh, a good sort of half an hour or so because we have to factor in that uh, certainly a couple of these people might need a bit of an early night tonight with a game tomorrow evening. So uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll continue until about nine o'clock this evening. So plenty of time if you're watching on the live stream as well to get your questions in tonight. If you are just uh, logging on and, and watching this uh, for the f- first time this evening, welcome to a whole City Fans Forum. We have an audience which you may or may not be able to see on the live stream. But can we at least acknowledge with sound that you're here this evening?
And really nice to see so many of you because you've braved the snow to get here tonight. And it's, not forget, it's April tomorrow. Um, we've got a question from an audience member this evening. What's your, what's your question? What's your name, please? Uh, my name's Wayne, and we've talked a lot about the present and the future. I just wanted a little bit of background on how you got your journey to Hull City. So this is for Ta Tan and Shotter. T um, Tan first, when you first got the inkling that you wanted to own a football club or be involved in, what drew you to Hull City, especially with the, the history of the previous ownership? And then I've got a question for Shotter. Fantastic game for the legends, brilliant goal. How long the next day before you could walk? <laughs> Are you playing tomorrow night? <laughs> <laughs> I wish you touch something like which, uh, which is so, in, in one side it's quite painful because we cannot do anymore. And uh, that that's makes you guys special because uh, you love so much this game. And I can say, and I said this after the game also, Ibrox sees every single week, minimum three games in every level. It's like at the league level, then they go to Champions League or they play this UEFA Cup and they're in the last eighth and they see the old firm games, which is, by the way, tomorrow uh, early morning at the, or Sunday morning. And they still show 45,000 people to see old, heavy, <laughs> stiff uh, guys hardly moving with the, with the, um, with the ball and, uh, and being so happy when somebody make a goal. And of course I was lucky. And to be honest, my mom and dad cried <laughs> because they bring they're 75 both, and they remember probably 30 years ago, 25 years ago, when I was similar, doing uh, some good things uh, and scoring some good goals. And myself, I couldn't stop. I just get these 30 seconds when I see them just cheering, and I, I wanted to repeat this again and I repeat this again. And they just told me, listen, Shota, just... Uh, give time to Gaza also and some other guys also, You're not alone here alone. Have you, um, so have you shown, amazing. The, have you shown the, the, the goal to um, Ryan Longman and Tom Eves no, this week? No, I'm not here to show how good or how bad I was, so I'm here to to make them better and it's nothing about me. That's, that's, that's just like us, so... Uh, and that's someone who probably knew me before. And for me, was was like, as a person, as a as a like a one individual, it was amazing. Thirty seconds, which I cannot buy, I cannot bring back. It's 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 real dream, which get this adrenaline and energy and electrics, which uh, which I, you know, get in my back, and uh, bring it here. So I hope to spend. Uh, back to the boys and to the team and to the, my job. So thank you for that again. Um, Tan, the question I think to you was around um, buying or being involved in the, the purchase of Hull City. When did you, when did you decide you wanted to um, be part of the ownership of a football club and, and, and did you take into account where the, 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 the sort of the disconnect between sections of supporters and the previous owners? Um, I, to be honest with you, this part was, uh, I, I've always, in my previous you know, career, I've always wanted to be part of uh, a, a successful historic club. Um, of course, um, we have, we've, I've been supporting clubs in, in, in national team level in, in Turkey, etc. But to be in, being in the, in, in the board of, of a, such an important club is such a privilege for me. So when we, did we decide it? It just happened one year ago, to be honest with you. Uh, you know, our chairman is, has always dreamed about, you know, being, being buying a club in, 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 in England. And then, uh, probably you're going to laugh, we were at three in the morning and we, we were discussing and said, let's buy a club in England, but it has to be something, you know, significant, something that, that would, you know, um, 
kind of like symbolizes his celebrity status as well as the people and as well as the culture of the club kind of has to come together. So I said, give me, you know, a little bit of a time and I'll look for it. And then uh, with our, you know, um, kind of like a global reach and, and knowledge in English uh, football industry, um, I've come close to Hull City Tigers. Why? The, you know, the previous ownership, uh, yes, they did a lot of uh, mistakes. However, they they somehow figure out how to how to manage the club properly, and uh, as opposed to as you can all probably following uh, last week. Is it true? Yeah, last week uh, most of the championship clubs announced their losses, right? Um, so with this club being so healthy, among most of the other championship clubs that had exp you know announced last week, we knew it months before because of you know like uh, researching and talking and, and and you know doing the diligence part of it so Hull City being like a win-win situation because we knew you guys were um, willing to come back and uh, had some looking for a peaceful moment to get back on the on the supporting end of it the club was in a very healthy situation and um and players local players like Louis and all the young boys and, and other boys were so talented and, and there was a you know big asset in here. Uh, and then we flew over six months ago and then just literally the, the chairman fell in love in the plane and then and, and I was just just after spending one week in here, uh, I, I really felt like I belong in here. It, it may sound cliche but it, it is true. If you don't find identity to to your to where you work, you never work. So it, so it became passion to me. Then just just being the ownership, being part of the ownership of the club. Uh, so it's to, if 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 you want to put a timeline, nine months to one year. But um, our passion six six months, I should say, and countless hours of negotiating and saying yes. And, and here we are in front of you since January. Um, just, keep the, just keep the microphone because this sort of follows on, I suspect, from what you've just said. And this from Alex um, on social media tonight. Um, and, and this is something that as BBC Radio Humberside, we, we learned a, a uh, about as well when um, Achun gave us an interview. Um, he's, he's hinted at something happening at Hull City which will be a world first in football and, and will be a shock and surprise and it's never been achieved before. Um, very cryptic. Can you shed any more light on what he's hinting and talking about? Uh, is, this, is this the Turkish version of the great pottery throwdown? Is this uh, going to be hosted at MKM Stadium or something like that or spinning chairs in the dugout? Um. As much as I want to share, I think this is the stage for, for chairman to share that. So I leave it in the misery. So um, a, mis a mystery, sorry, um, apology, uh, in the mystery. And then uh, let's wait and see. Uh, so. the, more, the more this goes on, the more people will speculate, though. Will we be surprised, at least, when it's announced? I think you will be. Well, that makes us more interested, I think. <laughs> um, let's go back to the audience and an audience member with a question tonight, please. Hi, uh, my name's Chris, and um, can I just start by saying, and I hope I speak for most of us here, um, just a great thank you for your fan engagement that is really noticeable since the new ownership has come in. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll pick up on that with you, Jim. Um, it's, it's fair to say, and I'm, I use the phrase disconnect because that's a, a polite way of putting it, but um, there, there was a, a great number of supporters who gave up supporting Hull City for a period of time because of the previous regime, who were starting to come back now. Um, what kind of challenge is that presenting you? It, it is, I mean, I imagine it's, it's quite a healthy one, really, because you come in as a, a completely new entity, new ideas, fresh faces. Um, is that a great place to be in the business of football? Well, I think so. And I'll, I'll, I'll just kind of go backwards, if I may, and just elaborate a little bit on what Tan had to say about, you know, when Tan got involved in the, in the football club. I mean, he does himself a disservice, really, 
because I was kind of his friend who stood on the sidelines watching him go through it for six months. And believe you me, I couldn't have done it. I mean, it truly did test the patience of a saint, I think. My job, I would say, was like uh, I was the bucket man mopping his brow for six months saying, come on, in with the love, out with the anger. You know, keep taking deep breaths, keep going, keep going. And I think that's, you know, one of the reasons why the, um, you know, the club was, it took a long time to sell. I think it was public knowledge that it was, it was for sale for five, six, seven years, however long it was. And, you know, fair play to the Alams, the business people. They drove a hard bargain. And um, I think it took, you know, special people to actually, to have, to really have that want and desire to, to ultimately own, you know, what is your football club? So, you know, it's testament to them. And like I, said, I stood on the sideline and watched in awe because I just simply would have thrown my toys out the pram probably an awful lot sooner. So I think one of the things, it's a long-winded way of saying, I think one of the things that appealed, you go, why Hull City? Well, I've been involved in a few football club buys and sales and looked at other th deals that have failed. This was a superb club to buy, honestly superb. Actually better than I even recognised before I was fortunate enough to get into it. And I think the disconnect that, 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 that you say happened between you know the previous ownership and the supporter base, it almost makes it more appealing, doesn't it? Because if there were, you know, if we were top of the Premier League and 20,000 people turning up every week, it's like, where'd you go from there? So I think we're buying a football club the guys are buying a football club at the right stage. And it's, we have to give you a reason to come back. I don't think we take for granted that, oh, it's great, new owners, you just turn up. We have to create that platform for you guys. We understand people have lots of other things that they can spend the money on, and money's dwindling for everybody at the moment. So we've got to give you that opportunity to try to get the price point right, just to try to be straight and transparent with you. Because... You know, not not always, not every fans forum that we ever do might not be this cosy, you know, but I think what we will attempt to do is always look you in the eye and say yes, say no, try to be as transparent as possible and not mess too much with your heritage. I think that's where I think that's where we get to. But you know, we it's it's our challenge to kind of gain your trust and confidence and to gain your help. Because, you know, whatever we talk about, you know, the manager, Tan, Louis, whatever they talk about their ambitions for the football club, they can't actually, I know it's, again, cliched, they really can't do it without you. There's no point. If you don't turn up, bring your friends, come back in numbers, then we probably won't ever get to where we want to get to. And you guys have been there before. I've never been to the Premier League before. You guys have. And I'm sure that's where we'd all like to try to get back to. But... It's going to take, you know, like most families, it's going to take some blood, sweat, tears, probably a few rows along the way, and hopefully we we'll, can all have a party when we get there. Um, I think there was someone to the side who wanted to ask a question, so um, we'll, while we do that, while we go down to you, sir, um, one from Facebook, uh, Mike Gibson, a uh, question, I suspect, for the, the, the two of you. Um, what's the update on contracts? We know there are a number of players out of contract in the summer. Um, I think, Shota, today you've talked to my colleagues from BBC Radio Humberside in the, the day's press conference about Richie Smallwood and, and um, George Honeyman, but um, sort of widely... There are a number of players out of contract this summer. Where are you at in terms of either tying them down or, or potentially releasing a few? Again, uh, this is going to be a more political answer, but I will, I will try to be... Um, I'll give you my most honest answer because here we are, Louis, and I'm looking at his eyes, in, in his eyes. What's your contract status? So he's, he's, he's staying with us. He's, <laughs> he's staying with us for sure. But um, I, have, I have my coach next to me and then Gaffer wants... Uh, and and ambition, he has ambition, you know, like to, to be successful. And I've talked to you a little bit before. Um, look, we have obviously expiring contracts. And, and, and yes, we came in, the honeymoon is over. But to do this right, we have to finish the league in the right place. What's the right place? We don't know. We have to understand. Because these boys, they've been fighting, you know, uh, uh, to, to stay in championship climb up in this championship. So they need to complete their mission for us to reward them. This is not just sacking people or releasing people. It's actually about rewarding this group of guys in the most honorable way. So 
um, until everything is set stone and the season is, is completed, I'm going to keep the standard as my chairman's you know, uh, uh, will at the same time that we're not going to get into contract issues and distract players, distract fans, distract uh, the, the coaching staff as well. Having said that, are we not going to discuss? For sure. And then this is all about rewarding. So we want to keep, because our team is young, as you can all know. So these boys, they, they have more to give to us, some of whom will, some in different level. So the summer will bring us a lot of opportunities and also a lot of uh, uh, um, time to create the team that you like. But we have no intention uh, uh, changing the core nucleus of this club by, from the player side. So uh, players always, you know, I've been, again, with, with my previous experience, players expect to know their future. Uh, uh, of course, I respect that. But also being on the ownership side, we also want, would like to see where we are as well to drive the business to a better place. So to answer it in, in again, most genuine and honest way, uh, everybody will be rewarded and discussed properly and openly and as transparent as possible and to make this journey with us more longer terms. But timing of it, is not now. Is 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 should be towards the end of the season, more maybe the end of the season, where we see how everyone contributed, including us and the players. Uh, the gentleman uh, has been patient waiting for his question. What's it, your question? It, it's for Tan. You touched earlier on that the academy was the future of the club. What is your plans for investment going forward with the academy? Um. May I ask you, in terms of investment, are we talking about fi financials or...? Financial and bringing it all back under one roof type of thing. Yeah. Why, why do we vision this academy and, and, and the, the senior team being all together in the stadium and then in, in, in the city centre? Is because it has to be a trans transformation from the young boys all the way to the up. Um, that's why it requires for us to build, you know, pitches, um, change up certain structure within the current uh, stadium scheme, and it, it will cost us money. But it just I don't really want to get into the, the financials. It will not please you. Why? Because we know the numbers, how much we spent, and Jim can also he's been fantastic with the numbers today. So um, the, he can tell you the numbers, and I can tell you the numbers. Uh, if if you just focus on the numbers, it'll just discourage us. It's all about, you know, creating the right environment for young hull boys and, and, and surrounding areas uh, to come in to the city centre and play and, and become and, and be part of men's league that I call championship. And I think uh, it's also very important to to make identity for for Hull, for the club we we work and uh, it's the the meetings we had uh, the previous meetings with the academy coaches with the head of academy to create on on our traditions which been built this club in previous years uh, last uh, I don't know when it's the first time academy been 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 um, started here probably last 40, 50, I don't know, 25 years. And just to have our own, and we already make steps on it. It's, it's going to be a huge investment also based on the traditions, based on the, the public, we want how, what kind of game they want to see. It's identity of the players we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna see and uh, build with them and then the coaches as well. So I think uh, all these meetings we've been done till now been how to bring these all ideas together, then bring this to the field. And if we will have a philosophy, if you have a way how to do it, if we will know how to raise kids with this, what is all going on now around the football. 
not only in this country or also in Germany or in Spain or in France. So that's going to give us much more, much more feedback. And then if we have, of course, the financial support and I believe uh, every club, every club who thinks to feed the, the academies, if they have uh, like eight to 10 percent, also from the previous budgets, budgets to to spend for for the academy, plus what which I had this philosophy: how to train them, how to make them, first of all, good persons, honest persons, good kids of uh, of good friends, of good social uh, kids, which uh, tomorrow will go around us, and not all of them will be the football player, but. If someone will be a football player, then it's going to be definitely the star. So it would be maybe regionally, because it's not uh, been done too far. It's been get some injections also from uh, from the previous times. It will be coming kids here from outside. But if we would have this, this is without this, I don't believe whatever in West you do, you can have a 10 fields, I don't know, 25 coaches, thousand balls or let kids play only one will play maybe 10 will play because they're just being talented and that's it but if we would have this philosophy if we would know and every every coach every head coach will know on what the basic is that and they will put another things on it and another 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 it's going to be huge huge job done and then of course financially it will be supported by the by the chairman and by the club and you will see how quick it goes then it's definitely you could see it's a lot of examples of this but without philosophy without knowing what kind of football we want what kind of football you want to see what kind of kids we want to have not just like a one someone who just dribbles it's always nice to see someone dribbles two or three or someone scores but also good goalkeepers good central defenders good midfielders so what what shows today's football? Probably you also watching some clubs, except of uh, of the whole, and having a good feeling when oh it's a nice football. That's a football we want to see also. That's going to be very important. And if it combines with finance and with ideas, it will be like uh, I think the first the job we will and we started already. And I think. Uh, Next year will be the first year where we'll, we're going to make these first steps for this, and it will get the stronger and stronger. That's, I think, the complete uh, the answer for for your uh, the the question is. Can I? We'll um, we'll go to a couple of the. Uh, you you can see them better than I can. The the lights you can. Um, can we, you just wave your arms and we'll bring the microphone um, down May to I? you? Yes, yeah, <laughs> uh, I would normally wear glasses. Maybe I should have put them on. Um, can I just talk about that before we go to um, that audience member, Louis? Um, can I just talk about that cultural thing? Oh, if I may, just, yes, uh, just a quick add-on to Coach's great point. To, to co you know, he complimented my comments. Um, for you, uh, like it's uh, it's it's privilege for me to mention that uh, not many people know Coach. Yes, he coached in uh, Uzbekistan in, 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 in the Asian Champions League, etc. But his one of the main mission was, which we fell in love, to develop football in that country, and that's why he's so keen on on, on philosophy and educating and, and bringing football to to the lives of the community members and then and creating p proper citizens. So I really thank you for just like jumping in and, and, and complimenting on that one. And one more quick point. Uh, I just don't want to be misunderstood. Uh, Bishop Burton, who um, our, our, our academy is currently uh, using their facility and, and they've been so uh, warm and open and welcoming to us. Uh, by me disclosing our uh, uh, ownership ambitions and vision i don't want to uh, discourage them because eventually the you know these young boys belong to the city center yet uh for the time being they have been housed to us housing us and 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 giving their superb facility 
to, to, for us to be able to develop these young boys to this level. So I just wanted to be, you know, for Bishop Burton to be recognized in, in, in a proper way as well. Um, that cultural thing um, that's been spoken about, not just in that answer, but I get the feeling that that is very much the ethos of this evening. Um, from a player's perspective, do you see that change? You've, you've, you've had the privilege of playing for a couple of clubs now, and in Leeds, we, we may not, there may not be many in this room that are particularly supportive of Leeds, but there is a culture there, isn't there? There is a, an ethos within that football club. Um, are you seeing the culture within Hull City changing, especially given you are one of the, the contingent of Holborn players, Louis? Yeah, 100%. And I think not just from the stuff that the guys have all touched on tonight. I think it's it's evident in, obviously, unfortunately, you guys don't get to see the, the work that goes on closely in, in the training ground behind closed doors, so to speak. Um, hopefully that transforms on, onto the pitch and, and in the results in the coming weeks and, and the coming seasons. But I think like you touched on there, I, I came from an academy, personally speaking, that was all under one roof. Granted, we was in at different times to the first team when when I was a young um, a young lad and, and I think what Tan's trying to sort of reiterate the point that having it all under one roof and, and being able to show these these young kids the way and, and have something to strive for and actually see it w with their own eyes and, and be able to put a plan in place and, and again like the gaffer touched on having a philosophy that you follow, you stick to and, and there's a plan and, and that's the reward at the end of it, you, you become sort of your dream and, and again the big thing for me is um, being from a close-knit family the gaffer touched on it, not every young kid, boy, girl, whoever chooses to play football as a kid, realistically, not every every person is going to make it as a professional footballer. But if you can come out the other end of a philosophy, a programme, a, a strategy that a club and an academy puts in place, and you come, about, come out of it as a good person, and you go on to, to do really well in whatever career that you choose to do, then, then surely that's an amazing thing, regardless of whether you become a footballer after that or you go on and have a fantastic career, whatever you choose to do. If you're a good person, for me, that's, that's more than enough. So. Um, we'll finish in about five minutes so we can give you the chance to have pictures and that kind of thing. So apologies if we don't get to your question either on the live stream or here this evening at Middleton Hall. But um, we can have, probably get a couple of rapid fire questions in from the audience. So, James, can um, I just a, ask that we go to Pat a, in the centre? There's a lady centre. with her arm up. Yeah, so thank you. Lady with the, uh, the, the uh, well, I'm going to say cream jumper, but it could be, it could be lemon. Uh, yeah, what's your question, please? Pat Ellis, a lifelong um, season Pat holder, starting from the old Boothbury Road, uh, Boothbury Park days to the new stadium. Um, I really wanted to make the point about the academy and how important it is, and how, as, as um, long-lasting supporters, it's great for us to see our own homegrown talent coming through. I want to pay a, a, a particular respect to um, the academy staff, especially Andy Dawson, who has been a tremendous ambassador for this club, mm. as, a, as a footballer, as um, a coach, and now very much involved with the academy. Um, I'm sure a lot of other people who are here today um, will agree with me that it was a, an absolute privilege to support our own club at Wembley. And um, to see our own players, we, I never thought that I would see that Premier League football in my lifetime. And so obviously that's what we want to strive to, and I'm sure everybody does. But the one thing that, um, to get the fans back to the stadium, we've got to get a much better atmosphere give the team something, uh, um, uh, uh, music that raises the crowd, that gets the atmosphere. We've got to produce, I'm afraid to say, a better um, quality of football on the pitch because supporters will come back in the thousands if we're producing a good team with winning. We can't win every game, but at least when we see our players giving their 100%, that's really all we ask. So, you know, let's, let's keep the academy a very strong part of this club.
because there are already there are already scouts watching our young players from a very early age, and I see that visiting Bishop Burton on a regular basis. Well said, Pat. Thank you for that. Um, Probably the final question from social media this evening, and it's from Mark. Nice and straightforward. We do like a uh, straight, direct question. Are we signing Mirza Ozil? <laughs> now, bearing in mind the last time we did this was on the transfer window the day before the club sold Camille Grzycki and Jared Bowen on the same day. So it's less tense a question this time. Um, will Hull City fans get to see Mirza Ozil in the summer? You, you want to answer? <laughs> um, no, it's, it's, you know, Mr. This is our chairman's um, longtime friend. And, uh, I, you know, for us, he's, he's a fantastic player, legend. Yet at the same time, again, it's not transfer window. It's not, it's not something that I would be comment, commenting. I think the question should be to, to chairman. Having said that, surprises always, we talked about, you know, um, mystery, but it's not Mr. Ozil, I believe. Uh, if it is, that the chairman should be announcing and then should be telling us anyway. Very political. Um, one final question. I think there was a young, there was a young person who wanted to, uh, to ask one question. We'll end on a, a, a young person's question, if we can. Um, I don't know if you've got the microphone or not, or whether you need to shout. You've got the microphone. Uh, you are the very last person to ask a question. Uh, what is it and what's your name, please? My name is Riley, and I have a question for Shotter. Well, do you reckon um, Nathan Baxter will be in the squad for tomorrow's game? Uh, the question from Riley, will Nathan Baxter be back in the squad or the team tomorrow's I game? I was hiding this uh, for our opponents and was trying to put this... Um, like to not let them know, but after the, I will tell you the privately uh, what I'm tro gonna try to to do tomorrow. If you would promise me to not say to anyone. Okay. Um, well, that uh, we had to end with a question like that. So, Riley, thank you very much. Uh, BBC Radio Homicide is looking for a sports journalist at the moment, so I'll give you the, the, the link to apply for the job. You ask the right questions. Um, thank you so much. If you're watching online, watching on a device at home, uh, or you're here at the Middleton Hall this evening, thank you very much for making our guests feel very welcome. Um, I, I'll just do a very quick snapshot of the room tonight. As Hull City fans, are you happier now than you were a year ago? Yes. Thank you to everyone who's been a part of this this evening. Thank you to Hull City Football Club for allowing our guests to be here this evening. Thank you to you for getting tickets to be here tonight. Thank you to our audience at home. So, And also thank you to the team from the Hull City Official Supporters Club who I know have worked really hard for several weeks to make this event happen uh, and in this surrounding as well. Also to the staff of the University of Hull for uh, enabling this to happen this evening. Uh, so would you give a big show of support for everybody involved in tonight's event? Um, there is a game tomorrow night, so I'll just close on a final question to Shota. Can the game against Huddersfield, who, let's be honest, are doing incredibly well at the moment, um, can this be the turning point for the home form? Uh, what's, your, what's your gut telling you ahead of tomorrow night's game? Actually, actually all the home games, we've been really looking that it's going to be our best game. So... That's a feeling I have. That's a feeling we had in the dressing room. And that's a feeling in the, in the bus when we sit in an away game and coming back home with our own supporters behind us, having a good game, having a point, having a three points, having a good goals and a good actions. And really like if it was a whole week or the really couple of days to, to come back home and to show much better. You guys just said like uh, you happy than 
you've been probably a year ago, but I want you to be happy, trouble happy, three times more happy tomorrow, after tomorrow, next year and year uh, also coming. That's the way we, we feel and, and, and uh, that's the way we feel in the in, in, in dressing room, in the bus also going to the, to the stadium. And that's what I'm waiting since I, we, since I beat Swansea here in my first game here. It was a great, it was an amazing start. And since that, uh, fortunately, uh, I do not do that what uh, we all waiting. So I hope to, to have this tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, lovely to see all of you. Thank you for your amazing questions and being a part of this event, be it online or in the Middleton Hall this evening. Uh, would you say a thank you to all of our guests this evening and a safe journey home? <laughs>